So welcome everybody to our event today hosted by the Oxford Forum for Questioning Extremism on Divides in America, an interview with Frank Lance. This is obviously extremely topical at the minute, especially given how close the election last week proved to be, providing no clear indication that America is less divided now than it was four years ago. I'd like to take this opportunity to say a big thank you to our sponsor, T45, a new news service providing the facts we need in this age of disinformation. We'll be in discussion today for around 45 to 50 minutes. Hold on, the facts you need. I'm gonna give you some language right here. We provide the news you want, the facts you need, and the accuracy you deserve. Change your language. The news you want, the facts you need, the accuracy you deserve. Thank that's you. for free. Well, that's for our sponsor to take in. So yeah, we'll be in the discussion today for around 45 to 50 minutes, leaving about 10 to 15 minutes for questions from the audience at the end, where you can use the raise hand option. We'll be able to unmute you and you'll be able to pose questions directly to our guest. We are delighted today to be joined by the one and only Frank Luntz. Frank is one of America's most famous political strategists and pollsters, best known for his work in shaping communication messaging for politicians, largely from the Republican Party. So thank you for joining us today, Frank. We're extremely grateful to have you on and what I imagine has been an incredibly hectic week for you. So looking at the election that just happened, there does seem to be a significant minority of Americans who genuinely do not believe the results of the election, partly due to President Trump's claims of widespread voting fraud. So my first question to you is, how damaging is this to American democracy when arguably one of the most fundamental aspects of it namely faith in the electoral process is being challenged by so many of its citizens. So you got to tell me, is the chat room open for comments from people? Uh, yeah, people can comment in there. Okay, then I want, I want, let's start the comments going. Let's, let's start a, a conversation. Let's pretend as though I'm there rather than uh, 3000 miles away. And I'm going to raise something with you and I want to get the reaction from the students who are watching this. I know that, that most people want this election to be over with. Most people are saying that Donald Trump should, should acquiesce, uh, acknowledge that he lost, and just go away and uh, let Joe Biden be president. And I don't agree with that, and here's why. I don't believe there is any chance whatsoever that Donald Trump can win this election. Zero. Literally zero. But I remember what happened in the year 2000 when Al Gore in the middle of the vote count uh, dropped out under pressure from the Supreme Court and endorsed his opponent, George W. Bush. And forever, one third of the Democratic Party believed that the election had been stolen from them because they never got a full count. They never got the accountability that they wanted. They never got a resolution that they were looking for other than the Supreme Court essentially stopping the count. Now, my job is to learn from history. As a pollster, as a historian, my job is to really pay attention to things that had happened, have happened, and try to learn from them. So I actually think as much as it creates chaos, it's actually better for Trump to stay in, go through the uh, vote recounts where nothing happens, go through the lawsuits that are rejected, go through the entire process that he has the right to do. And when that process does not yield the, the uh, desired outcome, then he just steps aside at that point. I don't see that it's a problem. In fact, I see that it's an advantage because right now 70% of Trump voters, by the way, 85% of Trump voters thought he was gonna win on election night. Right now, 70% of Trump voters think he did win on election night. And we need to show them that in fact, that did not happen. So by following through on this process, by staying involved and engaged, and by doing the challenges that you have the right to do, I actually think it's good for the democracy because God help us if we have 70% of the Republicans believing that the election is not valid then we're gonna have a horrible, a horrible four years and we'll be even worse off then at the end of this than we are right now. So please people, whatever your reaction is, 
jump in and and comment on that. I want to know. I want to know if there's a case to be made, and I want your opinion. So go ahead. I mean, one thing I would say straight off is: Do you think that even if it goes through the courts and it's still rejected and thrown out, that there will be there will still that minority of people will go away? That they will then see it as valid if it goes through the courts and it's say rejected is his claims are rejected. That you'll have, you'll still have a significant percentage that'll think the election was stolen. I recognize that, yeah. but it won't be 70%. It'll be more like 30 or 40%. So I think that that this is so important. And to Dave Davide's uh, point, social media is horrible. Social media just confirms our worst fears. It just confirms our craziest notions and it encourages us to see the worst in people rather than to see the best. And I think that social media is a major contributor to where we are right now as a country. You still need politicians to wreck it, but social media is the greatest tool anyone ever could have wanted to wreck democracy and wreck civility and decency and just to cause these horrific divisions that afflict us right now. Yeah, that's fair. But so do you see it as also say, looking at, say, a more positive aspect for the democracy was the high voter turnout, which was something that you yourself had predicted? Why was so, you know, around six weeks ago, I watched an interview where you predicted around even like a 75 to 80 percent turnout in this election. And to some extent, you're right in that the turnout was over the highest in over 100 years. So why was it so high this year compared to 2016? And is that in some ways a positive knock on? of the Trump presidency is that people are actually now more engaged in politics. Yes, Donald Trump did something he never intended to do, which is he made people more active. He made people more involved. He made people care about the results of the election. It was really, Donald Trump was more impactful than people wish him to be. Now, I know that he's probably unhappy that some of those people who voted for the first time did not vote for him, but that's what a democracy is all about. And democracies are at their healthiest when people participate. And this one, everybody got involved. The way that I look at it, if you didn't vote in this election, you're not alive. Because even people who don't care about politics cared about this race. I was in New York when they declared the results and I had just come out of my condo and they, everybody was flooding into Times Square, people beeping their horns. It was like a party, it was a celebration. It was amazing to be there in person and see this reaction. This is what Trump created for better or worse. I just, um, I think voter participation is better than no voter participation. And I think more act activities, political activities are better than less. So voting is the minimum, minimum point at where you're engaged with your democracy. But I'm hoping that voting is only that middle point and that people are doing a lot more about, um, a lot more than just voting, that they are attending debates, that they are writing op-eds, that they are involved in phone trees. And, and I'm looking at the questions that are coming in and they're all really good. By the way, I'm gonna keep this to 45 minutes overall. So when we hit, what I would suggest is I'm gonna answer every question you have, but I would suggest if there's a way that you start taking some questions now and then we combine it. So you'll do some of your questions and then you'll take some from the uh, chat room and from the, um, from the exchange that's already going on, sure. if that's okay. Yeah, well, so just to respond to them, what you said, so on the flip side of that, you, know, you go around speaking to people who kind of aren't ever usually listened to so why are they so disillusioned with politics that they don't come out to vote? You know, even this election, you still had about a third or maybe just under of eligible voters who looked at both candidates and didn't feel that either of them reflected their views in an election that was billed as so important and so existential on both sides. Because that third, a lot of those people are new citizens. A lot of those people are just turning 18. We still have a very mobile population. Even though we gave people every possible way to vote, some of them waited too long. We just, we always have this because we don't make it mandatory. 
And I do think that the turnout was not a, uh, I think it was over in the 70s of people who are eligible. And I believe that the turnout among registered voters was actually in the 80s. So I don't, if this is the biggest participatory election in 100 years, I'm not gonna look at those who don't vote because they're not relevant to me. Sure, no, that's fair enough. Um, so looking forward, I know a lot of people were hoping that this election would be the end of Trump, that it would kind of signify a complete rejection of him and everything he brought with him. Can you explain to an audience watching from the UK how despite losing, Trump actually picked up around 3 million more votes than last time. And, you know, this was a very, actually a very tight election. There was no blue wave in the way people thought there was going to be. So is Trump, or at least his message here to say, because the results of the election suggest that his message is not going away anytime soon, and that he's fundamentally shifted the Republican Party. That's, and that, that's one of the reasons why there is no choice. You have to lift, listen to those Trump voters. And this is my issue with students, and I don't know where you all stand on this. For me, good manners and politics is important, yes. Donald Trump had horrible manners, but so did the people who cancel a Trump voter. If someone tells me, if a student tells me they voted for Trump, that's a statement because very few students do. And that's a statement of rejection of the status quo. It's a statement of, of somebody who wants to be heard, does not want to be overlooked, does not want to be forgotten. And I pay attention to that because I know how rare it is. I like the fact that Trump voters came back into the political system to vote for him. I'm not keen on the way he waged politics. I'm not keen on the meanness and just the aggressiveness because I don't think it's good for anybody. But I'm not gonna do anything to encourage them not to be involved, not to be engaged because it matters that much. And if I were to explain to a British audience why Trump did better, it's because he gave a voice to the forgotten. He gave a voice to those who really felt like they were working really hard, playing by the rules, and they weren't getting ahead. And Donald Trump gives voice to a less educated, a lower income segment of the population who, who's just had it with politicians and politics and just tired of being put upon. And I don't know if that translates, but just, they really wanted a change. And that's, that's what he was offering them. And after four years, they decided, 3 million more people decided this was the change they were looking for. But once again, you always pick the minority. So you've done it now twice. I'm more interested in what the majorities are thinking than, than the minorities. I, I, will, I agree that the American political system is essential that we protect and we provide a voice to those who are in a smaller community. But just as the British system doesn't really care about the opposition, in America, we've become very much a parliamentary style, even though we're still a, a representative democracy. But we act so much like a parliamentary style in how we approach government that uh, I understand why you'd be focused in, in, in this set of questions. Sure. If we can talk about moving forward then, looking at what we think about is gonna be the new president, Joe Biden, historically someone who is liked by people from both parties. And even during the Obama administration was able to use his personal relations with Republicans in the Senate, at least early on to get things done. So from this perspective, is Joe Biden the last chance to bring America together? Would there be anyone in the near future who you could imagine they could talk to people from across the spectrum, someone who has counted both Lindsey Graham and Bernie Sanders as their friends, or Canada's only going to get more polarizing? I'm afraid we're gonna get more polarizing, but I notice that you're reading the questions. So you've got them written out in front of you on your computer screen? Some, yeah. Because I can see your eyes moving back and forth. Mm -hmm. That's how much I want all of you on this call to pay attention. I want you to look and see whether these are genuine, whether they're coming from your heart, whether you've written them down in advance. I want them to see by how you look. And yes, you can look up in the air, but, but I'm watching you, that there's body language, that people pay attention to stuff like this. And it's why the really the best news readers are still reading a teleprompter, but you can't tell because they've made it so tight 
that you don't see it, you don't see this happening, that, that they're looking straight ahead, even though they're actually reading the words as they go down on the page. Um, authenticity is what the public is looking for right now, a genuineness. And Donald Trump is authentic. He's authentically awful at times, but he's authentic. And that matters to people. They want someone who's genuine and, and straightforward and someone who, who tells you the truth, no matter how damning that truth is. And that's Donald Trump. So there is still a value to, to his presidency. Well, no, it's interesting you say that because I remember when Kamala Harris was chosen as the VP nominee, you were against that decision based off the fact that you felt that she was inauthentic, a right. similar charge that a lot of people gave towards Hillary Clinton. So why has that become such a key thing? And do you think Joe Biden, for instance, is authentic? I think, I think Joe Biden is authentic. What bothered me about... Uh, Kamala was the interview that she did on John, on uh, uh, Stephen Colbert. Get this, please get this segment because you want to watch it. Uh, he, Stephen asks her about debating Joe Biden and she responds about just trashing him. And she responds, hey, it's a debate. And she's laughing that fake laughter. And she says, eight times in less than one minute. It was the debate as though what she says in a debate doesn't matter. To me, it absolutely matters. It matters as much as anything else you have to say on politics. And that's when I became really mad with her because clearly she doesn't care what she says. So she can say anything at all. And I think that's a real problem. So do you think then that, so would, would Joe Biden then count though for you as someone who, and why again, so similarly, like again, when do you think this became a change? When did this change happen when so much emphasis was put on authenticity over it's someone like, you know, Trump versus Clinton seemed to be, that was like the defining change for it, but had it happened before? It happened before and it's one of the reasons why Barack Obama got elected in 2008. Obama ran the most positive campaign. And by the way, I wanna give Joe Biden credit. I didn't pay attention to it, but Joe Biden ran a lot of positive advertising. And Obama's campaign was the most positive of any presidential candidate in modern times. It was even more positive than what Joe, than what, uh, Joe Biden's was, but Joe Biden still did a lot of positives and he deserves credit for that. A positive ad is much harder to do than a negative ad and actually make it work. And I think that the Biden people did that. But in the end, we have to be responsible for uh, for what we say about our campaigns, our candidates, our elections. And in the end, there are too many um, supporters out there that will articulate something that's not true if it helps their candidate get elected. And I always thought that the truth was the most important attribute of all in a campaign, that you can get away with almost anything except for not telling the truth. So then going back to what you said about Obama having the most positive campaign, if I just pick you up on that. So how do we go from one, from that in 2008 to then in 2016? How in eight years do we go from this incredibly positive campaign to two very, very negative campaigns? And my answer to you, and I'm going to move you slightly because I'm going to acknowledge something that's been happening to me for the last two weeks which is I've been falling asleep during Zoom calls. And it actually is possible, it is possible to do a call and while I'm talking, actually not off. I've done it several times. I'm gonna to start to do it with you if I don't stand up. Um, there is, it, the public has a right to know and the candidates have a responsibility to tell them. I, I believe the candidates can, can say and do whatever they want. That Donald Trump should not be, con that Donald Trump should be criticized but not condemned for how he carried himself. But that's his choice as a candidate that it's up to the voters themselves to set the bar by which they want the candidates to exchange. 
And Hillary Clinton back in 2016, she didn't campaign. She would go to one event a day, maybe two. Donald Trump was going to three or four. Trump would hang out with the audience. Hillary Clinton always kept her distance. She didn't engage the reporters. Trump wouldn't shut up. Trump was doing press conferences that would last an hour because he thought that as long as he was talking, he was winning. She, trying to get her to do a press conference, was literally just about impossible. And that's one of the differences between them. And that's why I think that uh, he did so well back then. And I think uh, why he surprised people right now, that he is different, that he does give voters the chance to challenge. He does give his opponents the chance to be heard, even as he fights with them. I don't approve of it but there is a value to it. So then, but, so then what happened in those eight years, would you say that you go, we can go from one candidate to the other? Well, how are they so, you go from essentially polar opposites? What, could, what would you say is the main thing that Obama could have done differently, for instance, that would have not led to Donald Trump? By giving 15% of the legislation to the Republicans. So if you're gonna change healthcare, say the Republicans, okay, we're going to give you we're going to give you two planks out of the 15 that we're going to pass and you can put into it whatever you want by giving the republicans a voice because they felt they had none and this is what joe biden is about to do exactly the same thing he's going to cut out anyone who worked for trump anyone who supported trump that this is his chance to get even for the last four years and all you're going to do is you're going to recreate the same thing the same environment one more time and then we're gonna have the same result. So when you say by giving that 15% over to them, but do you not think then that was also, again, people on the other side would say, well, the Republicans would refuse to work for him, you know, point, work, work with him at least. Yes, absolutely. That term. And, and yes, and, the, and they'd be right. There's mm -hmm. nothing that says in this election that you have to do that. But you ask me the question, do you yeah. want Trump or not want Trump? And I say the same thing to AOC. And then you know what they're gonna tell me? We won, they lost, screw them. And they're not gonna say screw them, they're gonna say fuck them. Well, yeah, have that point of view. And then you're gonna get a Donald Trump-like person again every four years. The reason why you didn't get it when we had uh, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, Bill Clinton, um, uh, GW, you didn't have that because each candidate was a little bit more humble than usual, was uh, more understanding than usual, that they didn't try to destroy their opponents. And if you try to get every last seat, if you try to get every last benefit, if you try to do what Donald Trump did which is does, which is to just, you try to win by making the other side lose. If that's what you do, then don't be surprised if you lose big time four years from now. And that's exactly what's gonna happen. So then who is, you mentioned then a lot about politicians, who's more to blame then for getting to this point of essentially trying to destroy your opponents or dehumanize them? Is it the politicians or the media? It's both. And it's not just media, it's social media. The politicians don't have to do it, but they choose to. The media doesn't have to cover it, but they choose to. Social media doesn't have to provide it to all of their people, but they once again, they choose to. And I think that in the end, we're gonna have to say as a society, and I don't like censorship, and I don't want, I don't want the government doing this, I don't want the companies doing this, but maybe we gotta decide at some point that not everything is appropriate, that not everything is helpful, that that when a president is commenting on a TV show, that we don't launch it off to every single American. I am a very concerned about advocating any kind of chilling impact on the dissemination of information. That's not what I wish to do at all. But I know that the status quo is not acceptable and I know that we have to make a change or we are going to poison an entire generation's mind uh, about, about politics and about divisions. We're heading there right now. 
Yeah, and I was about to say, has that poison not already been dropped in, or how do how can we move away from that then? There's always worse. It can get worse. It can get a hell of a lot worse. It yeah, so, I mean, again, thinking about poison, then what did you make of kind of the nature of the language and the rhetoric that was used in this election? You know, you had on the Democrat side was if you voted Republican, it's the death of U.S. democracy, and if you voted on the Democrat side, it's if you voted, sorry, if on the Republican side, if you vote a Democrat, it's the it's the end of the U.S. You know, there's going to be rioting, looting, socialism, anarchy. You mean basically that sounds like Thursday? As in, that's a joke. But yeah, so then what did you make of that kind of the vi the violence of the language that was used? And also, should I just say to the people that are writing in the questions, just if you could use the raise hand option and then you can ask the question uh, yourself. That'd be great. Uh, yeah, I, uh, we have no off filter. We have, and we don't watch our news anymore to inform us, we watch it to affirm us. So we're not curious about the other side, but we don't want to learn. We want to be confirmed in what we believe and we want to confirm others. So we're not in a listening mode either. And both of these are a real problem. And I think that Joe Biden is a very good person to have for this right now because this is not who he is. And this is not what he does. But um, geez, if we don't have a different approach, I think we're gonna have a problem in our country and in your country too. So what, what, how do you think, yeah, do you think with our country, the UK at least is following the same footsteps as the US? Yes, there are times when we're ahead, there are times when you guys are ahead. The fact that Brexit succeeded taught me that there is a hidden vote out there that would absolutely vote to change the political system if they had the chance. And they did, and they did. And we're gonna have more of that if we don't find some way to give people the feeling of being heard and the feeling that they matter, because that's the only way that they don't vote for increasingly extreme individuals. So going just quick back onto the media for a second, could you break down the term fake news for us? How has Trump managed to get this all around the world where in every corner people are talking, people talk about fake news? Why is there such the, the public distrust in the media is so, so high. And when did that start to grow? It started to grow decades ago. And it started to grow when the media started to choose sides. And now they don't just choose, choose sides. Now they're actually armed combatants in this battle. But the media was very, very willing to take the Republican side of a whole host of issues and principles. And now they're, it's out of control. So I was on the phone with, uh, with your ex-prime minister uh, talking about that survey. And, and it was fascinating to me how we responded to, to the results because we went over it. But more so, I don't think that this is solvable <clears throat> right now unless people want to solve it. I don't think that any kind of technology or censorship or a different approach is going to fix anything that we just want to fight. And there are times when that, that people feel that way. You may not, and I may not, and certainly no one who wears a jacket like that particularly wants to fight because you can get blood stains all over it. And if it lands on your tie, then you're okay. But if it lands on your jacket, you're in trouble. Uh, I don't... Uh, I don't know where we're headed, but I know it's not in the good direction. And I know that with every passing year, things happen in these political campaigns are worse and worse. And I think that we're reaching the point now where we cannot come back. Well, to switch up a topic, just a reminder, by the way, again, to the people who've asked questions to, to if they want to ask it themselves to raise their hands uh, to use the raise hand option. One thing people have been asking a lot about or talking about and particularly relevant to you, I guess, is people have now been talking about the death of the polling industry. Why is it so hard then for people to poll 
or to know the size of the Trump support? Why, again, was this a massive surprise? Why don't exactly. people respond to pollsters or are they not just being found? Well, they're, they're not lying. So I want to correct that misinterpretation. And then you got to start asking some of these questions. Um, it's not it's not that they're lying, it's that they're not participating. And Trump voters don't participate for three reasons. Number one is that the pollsters don't ask him. And I now, with my surveys, I insist that we call back the vast majority of participants and thank them for their time and engage them in a conversation because I need them to agree to respond. Second, is that because there is no, no direct interaction between the candidates and the, and the respondents, the respondents do have a paper, do have a, a roadmap for where things are going, but they don't have the intensity, they don't have the passion. And that's really important in, in understanding in politics. How are people voting who really care about something versus those who only somewhat care? We have a question from Alex up after for now. Alex, go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, but turn your camera on. Oh, sorry. Uh, how do I, I do that? Yeah. I don't think it's possible. I don't think that's possible. Yeah, in this webinar to format, it's not possible. Um, regardless of whether you can see me, um, my question concerns the Republican Party's kind of conscious choice to become a minority party as such, with the Senate now being held by 38% of the vote, um, the Republicans having only won the popular vote twice under two Bushes. Um, how does that continue, particularly when you now look at the Electoral College map and the change in the southwestern states, particularly if you look at New Mexico and um, Arizona and potentially Texas moving forward. How does that, how do they continue to have this balance? They don't. Unless the Republican Party changes, they will become a minority party. But the public back in 2008 when Obama won against John McCain, they asked the same question about the GOP and it took eight years for them to come back and they came back. When the Republicans won the majority of the, uh, of the House, of the Senate, of the White House in 2000, and then again in 2016, they wondered out loud, will this be the end of the Democratic Party? So I hear this every single two year period. Is this the end of fill in the blank? And in the end, for decades and now for centuries, both parties have found a way to readjust because when you lose, there's nothing more clarifying. By the way, you never see more clearly when a bullet's heading towards you and you never see more clearly when a ballot is heading towards you. It really does wake you up. Yeah. Another question that's come in from Davide asking, when do you think America will be ready for a female president? And how much was gender <laughs> effect on the electoral rebuttal of Clinton in 2016? There, uh, it was not, had nothing to do with, it had everything to do with Hillary Clinton, but it had nothing to do with her being a woman. <laughs> and everything to do with, she just didn't campaign. <clears throat> it was the worst run campaign in modern times. She was not involved. She would do one event a day. You can't do that when you're running for president. We don't know how sick she was and she may have been, um, but uh, it did not work for her. And in the end, you have to earn it. You have to show people you want it. The same thing happened this time, by the way. In the last 24, 48 hours, Joe Biden was at one event a day and Donald Trump was racing across the country. Biden won. But who knows what would have happened if Biden wasn't even doing those one events a day? And who knows what would have happened if a couple other things had just gone in a different way? <clears throat> I do think that, uh, that the passion of the candidate does have an impact on the vote turnout for that candidate, that it is contagious or infectious. And, and look, Joe Biden, for how unpopular Donald Trump was, 55% strongly unfavorable, 55% dislike him. Biden got 50%, Trump got 47%. That's not a brilliant electoral win when you got a president who's that unpopular. Uh, one more question from Ruben. What role does the electoral college system play in sowing division? 
I don't think it sows division, but I do think it takes the democracy one more layer away from the public. <clears throat> I know that I like the Electoral College, not mm -hmm. for the reason you all think, but because I don't want the candidates just to go to New York and Chicago and Los Angeles and Philadelphia. I don't want that. I like that they have to go to Iowa. They have to go to New Hampshire. They have to go to uh, Arizona. And, and um, in fact, those big states aren't even part of, of the places that they need to go to. I think that it's good that they're going to uh, type B media markets because that guarantees that more people get a chance to see their candidates, to engage with their candidates, and you get a chance to figure out whether they've got what it takes. That's fair enough. I think we've got a hand up. Yeah, Lucas, do you want to? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. This I was is just in backyard, by the way. I was just interested to hear. Um, so obviously, like the, the, the UK and the US, one of the major parts of their political system is that they're dominated by two parties. And um, if, if, if the US wouldn't have a two party system and there was more choice for the electorate that they could, you know, if you're on the left wing of the Democratic Party, that you'd have a, a more left leaning party and equally the same on the right wing and the populist right wing of the Republicans. Would that be a big, and I don't, I don't see it happening anytime soon, but do you think that that's actually perhaps quite a root cause of what's going on? It's a root cause of what's going on, but that's not going to change either. That we are going to stay that way unless if Mike Bloomberg had run as a third party, which I strongly pushed him to do so, then you could have had a very different outcome. But he was so determined to, to run as a Democrat that he forgot that his base of support are among independents are among those who don't vote in partisan democratic primaries. Thanks. I, uh, there's one. Uh, there's one question here. So, why asking about something you've done? So, so, why did you advise? This is from JJ. Why did you advise the U.S. government to alter the terminology around global warming and instead use climate change? Uh, to try and make it seem like less of a threat to the pr uh, public. And maybe this ties into, again, a question may I have. Would there, is there anything you'd say in your career maybe that you'd regret? I mean, I've seen kind of in some interviews expressing some sort of remorse about the way certain messages have been reframed and how that's contributed to a mo more polarized environment. When were you born? 2000. I did this research the year you were born. In fact, I probably conducted the first focus group at a time when you weren't even conceived by your parents. That's how long ago it was. And I am not, I'm the first person to say that I, that I get stuff wrong, that I re-examine. It's one of the reasons why I love teaching is that it gives me a chance to re-examine my own beliefs. And my greatest frustration with your generation is that you're so damn determined not to change a point of view. You absolutely know, and you, your questions are very good. You've done a good job. But you're, you're really focused on, not you, but your generation on proving your point. And I'm focused on figuring out, on challenging mine, on figuring out, I assume this is correct, but it can't be. I need to learn more. I need to understand more. And so I switched on global warming in 2009. I started working for the Environmental Defense Fund. Nobody knows that because the media doesn't, doesn't correct its mistakes. And they are the least humble profession out there. And it's not a surprise that they're having so much trouble right now because they, they suck. I mean, they, they, they'll, they're they lazy. And the reporters themselves know that my position changed 11 years ago. 11 years ago, and they still don't get it. Yeah, to be, I mean, I don't know when the person who asked the question specifically about global warming, because no, I had read as well that you'd appeared, I think, this year before Congress, yes. speaking about that very issue, about how you had uh, reverted yourself, your point of view. Um, so one question then from Luke, uh, what is, asking what is the future of the Republican Party? Will you revert to the Bush-McCain era or will Trump's rhetoric continue going forward? 
Uh, we don't know yet because we don't know who's going to step up and challenge. I think that there's going to be a major wing of the Republican Party that will still be evident and powerful and and dominant, but there are going to be challenges to it, and they're going to have the chance to have a battle of ideas. And you're going to see that in the primaries and the election in 2024. So we're, we're still three years away from that. But uh, that battle is going to be ugly as hell. And you know what? The Democrats are going to have the same thing as well. Because AOC does not want Joe Manchin to have any responsibility whatsoever. Uh, Dan, um, um, Elizabeth Warren does not want a moderate Democrat making decisions for her. So both political parties are going to be a little bit chaotic over the next four years. Uh, one question for me, why is it now that people with experience, people who are qualified, are, in, are not only not believed, but often ridiculed? You see this in politics, with, again, when Trump went up against Clinton, or in science, the way Dr. Fauci is ridiculed, despite his years of experience serving under both Republican and Democrat administrations. You saw even Trump was almost embraced for his lack of experience. Well, why is that? Why has that happened? Why has this change occurred? Because there's this anti-intellectual environment that existed when Sarah Palin was nominated in 2008. When I was your age, I joined, I went to Oxford. I joined the uh, Republican Party because that's where all the smart kids were doing. If you had straight A's, and I did not, but if you were a straight A student, you were a Republican. If you like to go to the li library, rather than go to the pub, you were a Republican. And all that's changed now. And it's changed because the candidate's running and it changed because of the environment out there. But uh, I don't know when it snaps back. It always does, but I don't know when that's gonna be. We'll go to a hand up from Boo Wolf. Do you wanna ask, yeah? Uh, yeah. Um, so this is this is pretty recent, actually, about 50 minutes to an hour ago. Um, Pompeo has said that there'll be a, a smooth transition to a Trump second term. Now, obviously, you're not, you know, com completely involved, but what purpose does this serve? I mean, what, what could he be alluding to? I understand that Barr's, um, you know, gone ahead with the legal proceedings, but again, yeah, what, what purpose does this serve? It was clarifying what's going on right now. And it may be that he simply doesn't believe and that, he, that he's nervous about the impact of what Trump is doing on the country. The attorney general is supposed to be somewhat independent of the president. So I like the fact that he did this. I don't, obviously, I don't, don't know the details, but I think it's a good thing to do. Uh, one thing for me, actually, asking about what affected the election. So one of the things, obviously, big things this year was the murder of George Floyd and the protests that followed. How do you think, how do you feel about the way that Trump responded to them? And in particular, I mean, I know that you were quite against his use of the, his law and order rhetoric. How did that compare to Joe Biden's more empathetic language with the electorate? Why was it different to Nixon in 1968? I wanted Donald Trump to. Uh, I wanted Donald Trump to challenge Biden on public safety, not law and order. <clears throat> when, when Americans hear the phrase "law and order," they think of cops, police hitting protesters over the head with sticks. When they think of public safety, they think of families walking together at night through their neighborhood without uh, a fear in the world. And I thought that Trump's language was way too caffeinated. He talked about dominating the streets. The people that wanted dominated, they wanted the streets safe and secure. And that's very different. Trump talked about his own supporters being warriors when they identify themselves as hardworking taxpayers. Everything Trump did was out of the framework of uh, uh, aggression. And it, he just should not have done that. It was a mistake for his campaign and we see it in the general election. Thank you. We can now go to Davide. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this talk, Frank. It's been really interesting. Um, so you kind of talk a lot about how politics is getting ever more divided, polarized, quite a negative 
message for a bit for the future. So for young people who do want to get involved in politics, other than remaining like really open-minded, have you got any other advice you can give us? Yes, two pieces of advice. Learn, first off, you, you were fine. Your question was fine. Learn how to talk and learn how to write. Learn how to talk. And this is what Oxford does such a great job. I'm going to show you something if I got it here because I need to do it. I'm so tired. And by the way, we're going to have one more question after this. I know you wanted to go an hour, but I really need to close my eyes. I've been doing 20 hours a day since the day before the election. You take a pen, you stick it all the way back in your mouth like this, and you force yourself for 30 seconds to talk to that pen. You can understand me now. It sounds ridiculous. I sound like an idiot. And I'm not even end up spitting on my computer. But I'll try not to. But after I'm done talking to this pen for 30 seconds, and when I take the pen out, I enunciate absolutely perfectly. Because this teaches you how to um, how to pronounce words in a way that you don't even have to focus on the words. I had a stroke in January. So you guys, there's no way you would know that. And so I've had to really spend time thinking about how I'm going to say the words that I say. You all are lucky. You don't have that problem. You can just focus on coming up with the right language. But being able to speak is the most important capability and it's not taught enough. And then the second thing is being able to write. And that's being able to write incredibly short sentences that are really punchy, that, that, that have heft. It's the reason why there's sometimes people ask me a question and they're expecting a long answer and I'll just answer, no, that's not correct. And just pause. And they're waiting for the follow-up question. There is no follow-up no follow statement. There is no follow-up statement. You simply say no, or you say yes. You learn how to speak and you learn how to write and you're, you have an edge on everybody else in politics. It really doesn't matter that much. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just ask them one final question. What do you say to the people then who, you know, there are some people who will come out and say, well, you know, America's always been divided. You know, we were divided during, you know, it's no bigger than, say, you know, it's always been 50% Republican, 50% Democrat. And these divisions that we see today are no bigger than, say, they were during Watergate. What do you say to those people? That this actually is worse than Watergate because Watergate eventually came to an end. At some point, you're a world power until you stop being a world power. The UK was the most powerful nation on earth until it wasn't. That no matter what had happened, they always came back until they didn't. And so I assume nothing at all. I assume that, uh, I assume that things will continue to get worse unless we do something to make them better. And I assume that if we continue to be rude to each other, others are gonna be rude back to us and that it's gonna undo this unspoken agreement for us to disagree, but not be disagreeable. For us to really challenge each other, but to do so in a respectful and a kind manner. Uh, I, it's what I advocate, it's what I work for. Uh, I still have my point of view and it does change over time. I used to say, hasn't changed much. Actually, it's changed a lot. And I ask people to be open-minded in that way, to allow themselves the right of discovery that they actually have an alternative perspective than the average American that makes their perspective really interesting and worthy of getting to know each other. Thank you for that. I think that's a great note to end on. Uh, thank you so much for giving us your time today for a very, very engaging and interesting discussion. It's a massive shame. Again, we couldn't do this in person, but yeah, thank you so much for giving us your time. And I wish you very well. Thank you as well to our audience for coming and to our sponsors. Um, please look out for our next event on the 18th of November. And yeah, once again, a big thank you to you, Frank. Well, uh, if I'd been there, Right now, you have seen me topple over at Oxford. You've had to take me to hospital, but fortunately even foreigners are covered, so I would be okay. So thanks for doing it. Your questions are, sharp, are very sharp. You listen, you should, you should enter into politics at some point. Got it. Davide, I'm not so sure about. <laughs>
<laughs> thank you guys. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Take care. Thanks.